The reason you have to take your shoes off when you go through airport security is largely this guy, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber who tried to blow up a transatlantic flight in 2001. He now lives in Colorado in a federal supermax prison. This guy was the bomb maker for the first, first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. He also lives in Colorado in a federal supermax prison. This guy, the blind sheik, he was convicted for involvement in a whole bunch of different terrorist plots. He now lives in North Carolina at the Butner Federal Correctional Complex there. Remember Charles Manson? Charles Manson lives in California at Corcoran State Prison. Eric Rudolph. Eric Rudolph is the guy who bombed the Olympics in 1996. He also bombed abortion clinics and a gay bar. Eric Rudolph lives in Colorado, too, at the same federal prison as the shoe bomber guy. Uh, Zacharias Musawi, 9-11 conspirator, also lives at that federal supermax prison in Colorado. If you are a convicted terrorist in the United States, depending on what exactly you are convicted of, it is possible that you will be put to death. But it is likely that instead you will just get locked up somewhere and then you will just live in that part of the United States, securely locked up for the length of your sentence, which is usually your life or considerably longer. That's how it works. That's how it has worked forever. There are 373 people convicted of terrorism or terrorism related offenses living in 98 different prison facilities in America. There has never been an escape or a significant security problem associated with that fact. On his second full day in office, the then new president, President Obama, signed an executive order to close the offshore prison at Guantanamo Bay within a year. That did not happen because Congress stopped him from doing it. And passing the bill that pays for all our defense, the annual bill that gets passed every year, the Defense Authorization Act, uh, Congress added language blocking the president from moving any prisoners from Guantanamo to American prisons. It is, of course, one of the most high-profile, unfulfilled promises of the Obama presidency so far that Guantanamo is still open. And the president is not shy about that. He brings it up. He will explain why it is that he has not been able to get that done. There's some things that we haven't gotten done. I still want to close Guantanamo. We haven't been able to get that to okay. Congress. Congress has not allowed him to close Guantanamo. But it should be noted, this president has not sent anybody new there either. There were 242 prisoners at Guantanamo when he took office. It's now down to 166. People have been shipped out to other countries. A few of them have died. A very small number of them have gone through this cockamamie military tribunal process that was invented just to try to come up with a pseudo-legal way to deal with these people who we have locked up in a third country no man's land. But an interesting point of historical fact here, even before that day in the White House, when President Obama signed the executive order to close Guantanamo, even before he did that, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, chair of the Intelligence Committee, had already requested a thorough government report on how, logistically, prisoners could be moved from Guantanamo to American prisons. In 2008, remember, yes, Barack Obama was running for president saying he wanted to close Guantanamo. But the guy he was running against, John McCain, was also saying that he wanted to close Guantanamo. And, frankly, the guy who was president at the time, the guy who opened Guantanamo, George W. Bush, was also saying at the time that we needed to close Guantanamo. So everybody sort of agreed. And Dianne Feinstein apparently said, well, hey, if everybody agrees that that must be done, then let's start looking into how we are going to do it. That report requested by Senator Dianne Feinstein from the Government Accountability Office in 2008 has just come out. And it explains, the duh is silent, that yeah, people convicted of terrorism offenses are already safely held in American prisons. A lot of them. There are 373 terrorism convicts being held in 98 different facilities that are capable of holding the kind of people who are held at Guantanamo, even if there might have to be modifications to those prisons in order to hold them there. In addition, the GAO also notes that there are military facilities in the United States capable of holding the Guantanamo prisoners as well, with the added benefit that those facilities are only about half full right now. That defense spending bill that Congress uses to block President Obama from closing Guantanamo, that bill is an annual thing. It has to pass every year. And so every year that he has been president, Congress has been passing a version of that bill again every year that says these people at Guantanamo cannot be moved to American prisons. And that bill is being debated in Congress right now, just as this report is coming out, saying how feasible it would be to move those remaining guys from Guantanamo into the American prison system. 
And so Congress has to decide whether they're going to continue saying it is impossible to do this when there is this 63-page unclassified report saying in the most banal, obvious terms, duh, obviously, here is how you would do this. In the real world, honestly, I believe there is no reason for the most powerful country on earth to maintain an essentially lawless third country offshore prison to hold a specific tiny subset of prisoners that scare us too much for our own legal system. In the real world, this is eventually going to have to end. Of course, in Fox News world, it's never going to end, right? Fox News needs, for ratings' sake, to conflate a supermax prison in rural Colorado with your backyard. You know, your backyard where Charles Manson lives right now. But back here in the real world, eventually a decision is going to have to be made. Maybe it's going to have to be made now. Maybe it's going to be made this year. Joining us now is Spencer Ackerman, national security writer for Wired.com's Danger Room, who does actually live in Charles Manson's backyard, but only for fun. Thanks for being here, Spencer. It's a lot of fun, actually, Rachel. I understand the temporary tattoo with the, I know. I know. Um, Spencer, what, what are the implications of this GAO report, if any? Do you think this is going to change at all the debate over this issue in Congress? Well, logically, it shouldn't, because as you point out, everything in this GAO report is both well established and kind of obvious. There hasn't been anyone who's broken out of the Supermax or any of the other facilities around the country where uh, 373 convicted terrorists reside. On the other hand, it does seem like it's now somewhat possible uh, thanks to Dianne Feinstein in this report, to stake a claim right before the second Obama term begins that perhaps this is something to start fighting on again. And the fact that it's happening during the defense authorization debate sort of seems like an interesting marker to get that off on, on perhaps a new footing. I wonder if you sense on the issues of national security that you cover, if there has been a sort of change in resolve on the Democratic side. We've seen fights over issues like this for the last four, eight, 10, 12 years. But I feel like when I talk to Democrats about these issues now, when we see Democrats talk about these things in the media, they're sort of starting to treat these types of fights like the stupid ground zero mosque fight or some other conspiratorial right wing nonsense fight. There seems to be new resolve on the part of the, the Democrats and maybe on the part of the president that they're not going to lose fights when the other side's argument is really dumb. I think you're right about that. On the other hand, you know, never underestimate, you know, the spinelessness of a Democrat. <laughs> uh, so, you know, perhaps, well, you know, that, that's not quite so firm. On the other hand, I am kind of getting the sense, like you're getting, that at the very least, the firmament of political sentiment about national security might be ready to move. Uh, that Democratic politicians and uh, some political appointees do kind of want to, you know, see if they perhaps can move it. And this seems to be another piece of evidence. You know, you, you had Senator Merkley on uh, the Afghanistan amendment that he put out uh, seems to be another example of that. Spencer, do you see anybody inheriting the John McCain role on the Republican side in terms of being the Republican who other Republicans look to for leadership on, on national security issues. I feel like what's going on with the, the Susan Rice thing that he's doing is actually turning out worse for him than it is for Susan Rice in the end. I mean, we'll have to see, but I don't think it's wearing well on him. And I wonder if you see any contenders for that throne on the Republican side. You might. It's, it's very unclaimed on the Republican side right now. You definitely see uh, people like Senator Kelly Ayotte, who seems to you know, want to come out of that uh, Lieberman and Senator, I'm sorry, Lieberman, uh, McCain and Senator Graham mold, uh, taking uh, some more hawkish positions. Uh, you also see Marco Rubio uh, playing uh, another sort of somewhere between hawkish and moderate position that might go in some interesting ways. Um, you'll also see you know, Bob Corker, who's taking uh, a new position uh, on the, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee have an opportunity to do that too. But again, it does seem similarly to some of the Democratic side that this is somewhat unclaimed territory. And now that Senator McCain is going to have something of a diminished role because he's no longer going to be the ranking Republican on the Armed Services Committee, it could also arise some, you know, some new voices coming out. Yeah, and seeing that big list of Republicans on the side, on the mostly Democratic side on that Afghanistan amendment today, I thought was maybe a watershed moment. Spencer Ackerman, national security writer for Danger Room at Wired.com. Spence, it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you.